Hey everyone, back again. Today we're going to continue on with the lectures of the Will to Know from Foucault's lectures at the Collège de France. Here we're going to be starting with week five. And in this episode, so part three of four, we're going to cover weeks five, six, seven, and eight. And we'll end uh, to leave week nine for next week, for our next week. You know what I mean? But yeah, before jumping into it, hi, I'm David. I explain philosophical texts in ways to make them accessible to you. You probably already know the spiel because you're on part three right now, which would be weird if this is the first episode of mine that you've seen. So go back and see part one and two. Go back and see the more than 300 episodes I already have up. If you want to follow me anywhere other than here, you can find me on Instagram at theory underscore and underscore philosophy or on Twitter at David Guineo. Links for those things in the description or the titles for them that you can follow. If you want to help me out, like, share, subscribe, tell your friends. They might get a kick out of it. Uh, share it with your friends. Bombard them. And they might love you more. And that would be great. You can help me out monetarily via Patreon or PayPal, but obviously no pressure to do that. And yeah, let's jump into week five from the lectures on the will to know from uh, the Collège de France. But, and I should say that at the end, I will cover the lecture on Oedipal knowledge. I'm just wrapping that up with the very end, and that'll come at the end of part four. So here he begins by reflecting more on what he called last week epiphantic speech, which is, which is a kind of declarative speech, and how this speech was associated with truthfulness more so than other kinds of speech, speech that would be associated with sophistry, for example. Now, epiphantic speech is not reserved for the Socratic people or people post-Socrates, like Socrates, Plato, Aristotle. It can actually, or examples of it, can be traced much earlier before Socrates. And here he's referring to Hellenistic Greece. Specifically, he points to the ways in Hellenistic, uh, Hellenistic Greece, texts that included judicial and poetic discourse, or these kinds of texts that were judicial or poetic, used apophantic speech. Now, for a juridical text to be seen as legitimate, at this time, it had to comply with some basic rules. It had to have some basic characteristics to give it legitimacy. Now, when referring to a juridical text here, we're talking about like a suit. Like if you were to sue someone, the documentation you'd need to have or file out today in court in order for that, uh, that case to go forward. So for a juridical text to have been taken seriously at this time, what needed to happen, or these are the characteristics, is that a defendant or a complainant, someone accusing someone, had to write had to write on a tablet or any other thing that they could write on that they wanted to summon relative relative relevant witnesses, people who could vouch for them. So that was step 1. They had to write on this tablet that they were going to call these witnesses to speak on their behalf or in favor of them. So the second thing that must happen is the witness, the person who was summoned on the tablet, has to confirm what was written to be true. So the complainant says, uh, this person did this to me because Bob saw it, and Bob saw it. Uh, so Bob, in the second step, has to acknowledge that this is true. Then the witness must formally testify on the facts that were presented. Fourthly, the witness only responds to facts they believe to be true. They can't respond to facts that have nothing to do with their, their own knowledge base and perhaps nothing to do with the case itself. And finally, if the witness gives false testimony, they may be fined. So in this situation, Foucault is suggesting that it's not simply the way that words are spoken that grants them legitimacy. I mean, there are these rules that you have to say the truth. It's You can't just get up, uh, you can't just declare bankruptcy for any office fans out there and then have it be true. There have there are these procedures that comply with a basic recognition of facts and fact-telling and fact-checking. So in this situation, the individuals involved for Foucault act only as subjects or enunciators of truth. So truth is this thing that exists out in the world, and there are these people who can capture it, who have specific knowledge of an event or circumstance that they're able to testify about, and they can potentially verify with other information. But we're, you know, we're thinking of Hellenistic Greece here. It's not as though they had CSI teams that could verify like blood spatter 
patterns or like DNA samples, which isn't to say that's the only metric for factuality to determine if something is true or not. However, at the time, you couldn't just pick up a, like, there was no video recording of, of an event taking place. And so the truth was going to be relied upon by virtue of the fact that it was believed that the person would tell the truth through that arena in that space, you know, because it's a court of law, because they were telling this oath, and because there was fear of punishment. So remember, though, that the first step in this whole process was that the complainant or the defendant wrote down the terms on uh, like a stone tablet to set up the conditions for truth. So they would lay out the facts, and then the witness would come to the stand, and they would have to comply with those conditions. They couldn't add in new knowledge. They couldn't add in new uh, evidence. And, you know, we still see this in court of law today. You can't surprise your, uh, your opponent. If you're a lawyer, you can't surprise the other lawyers with new information unless there's an extreme circumstance where, it's like, something just came to light. You can't just conceal information to surprise them with it. You have to agree in advance what the terms of truth can be. So we can already see here that the concern was not so much for truth, you know, capital T, truth in the world. It was about an agreed upon truth for that situation. Now, this wasn't always necessarily the case. The way by which Greek people, you know, we're sticking with really Greek people here in Greek society, Greek society, there were different ways in which truth was arrived at and agreed upon besides this very specific procedure that I laid out, you know, writing on a stone tablet, summon a witness, they have to testify to that, all that, all that stuff. There were other ways in which justice, truth-telling were conducted. So for example, he draws upon an instance from the Iliad, and you don't need to know the whole Iliad to understand what I'm about to say. I'll give you a little bit of a plot summary here for this, this scene. So there's these two characters... Uh, there's Menelaus and Antilochus, and they're they're in this chariot race. And if anyone's seen the movie Ben Hur, which is extremely old, you I don't imagine <laughs> maybe not many of you have, but they dramatize it in in that movie at least kind of. Anyways, after that race, Antilochus is accused of cheating, and so a tribunal is formed to figure out what had happened and. It's not totally, like, people have written so many essays about this moment in the Iliad, like, whether or not uh, Antilochus cheated. Like, it seems as though perhaps someone had given him advice that he's actually able to take this one turn super sharply that no one else knew about except some old guy. I think it was his father or stepfather or somebody told him, like, hey, if you, you know, pull the reins really hard on your chariot on this corner, what no one on earth would do, it'll actually work and you'll be able to speed ahead. Some, something like that. So there's some kind of, it's not really trickery, but in any case, uh, a tribunal is formed to figure out if Antilochus cheated. So despite the fact that there was an overseer, interestingly, there was actually somebody there who was watching that corner where Antilochus sped by uh, Menelaus in a, in a way that no one could comprehend. This overseer was not consulted about uh, his, I believe it was a, he, his um, experience or what he had seen, his vantage point. So Menelaus doesn't ask this overseer, this witness, about his testimony. He says, instead, we're going to ask the guides, which are just, you know, uh, smart people in that, in that situation, maybe uh, elderly people, maybe kind of oracle-like figure, figures, to find out the truth. But then he's, Menelaus is like, actually, no, 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 Antilochus, you're just going to tell us if you cheated, because we trust you. And he does. Antilochus says he was reckless and unfair, and he told Menelaus this and everyone else this out of fear of punishment from the gods. So Antilochus believed that if he lied, he would experience a fate worse than death. He would, he would likely be tortured by the gods forever. He would be tormented by them. He would never have peace. And so the fear of punishment superseded uh, the truth because perhaps Antilochus didn't cheat, right? Perhaps he just 
use this different strategy, which I assume wouldn't qualify as cheating. But in any case, his concern for fear of punishment was greater than that of his desire to be seen as innocent in the eyes of uh, his comrades. So in this case, Antilochus is not trying to adhere to a law that all people have agreed upon and that he wants to remain part of, as though by being guilty, he'd be attached from a certain social body that he felt attached to. As I've already said, his real concern was the possibility that he was going to be punished by the gods, which is a very different reason to fess up to a possible crime or cheating in this case. And the truth emerges instead as a kind of challenge, where Menelaos challenges Antilochus to tell the truth, to say, is your truth, is your belief in your truth greater than your fear of the gods? And so Antilochus has a choice. And in that instance, he bows down to the truth, he, he or the challenge, he gives way to it. And so truth in this case emerges in a kind of agonistic struggle. So agonistic is a conflict. Uh, Aegon is referring to, it's a Greek term, referring to conflict or uh, struggle. So unlike the situation before in which there were witnesses in the other judicial process or in the judicial process, where there were witnesses who could uh, speak on behalf of somebody else, who could testify for somebody, in this case, there is no neutral, quote unquote, neutral witness. In fact, there was one, but their input is not valued. And so Foucault is using this to demonstrate how the way in which arriving at truth differed. There was, there was a pretty dramatic shift, and he's going to come to elucidate upon this shift uh, as we go on here. Now, what unites both these kinds of laws, that is, uh, you know, pre-Socratic law and classical law, is a commitment to a sovereign figure in both cases even though they are different. In one case, the sovereign figure is the gods. There's fear that the gods are going to spite me if I don't tell the truth. And in the other case, there's the fear of the judge, who's going to, you know, if you do not deliver the right facts, going to punish you through some, some form of punishment for having done something wrong. And then you will experience the added punishment of a fine for having lied. And even the people who spoke on your behalf might experience or might get received a fine for having lied. Now, I don't want it to seem as though there was this dramatic shift from one form of justice doing to another. Because Foucault is incredibly clear that even in Homer's texts, like, other, like the Iliad, uh, we can find examples of juridical law playing out and juridical justice playing out in the new form, you know, with a judge and witnesses and truth, arri be arriving at truth that way, with the example of Achilles' shield. Now, in the case of Achilles' shield, there were two people who are arguing about whether or not one of them has paid their debt for a murder. So they murdered someone and they have to, you know, pay some kind of debt for having done that. So a tribunal is called to adjudicate and decide who is most truthful and what should be done. So there's the person who has to pay the debt and the person who's going to receive the debt, probably the family member of um, the person who was murdered. So this tribunal is called to figure out who is most truthful in this situation and what should be done. So finally, what is called a histor, H-I-S-T-O-R, arrives to offer the final verdict because they are reversed in what Foucault says are rules, customs, and the way in which disagreements are resolved, which is a quote he's taking right out of Homer, uh, I believe. So here we see the kernels of a system of discourse in which the exercises of power, the exercise of power, that is the right to formulate a decision, the forced reference to writing, and the establishment of truth are all linked together. So when this histor is called, by virtue of the fact that the histor is not just saying that you know, one of you has to fess up because one of you is telling the truth, one of you isn't, and you're going to experience the wrath of the gods if you do not fess up and tell the truth. The history isn't doing that. The history is instead, say, instead saying there are established guidelines for dealing with these kinds of situations that have been, I guess, enshrined 
within social, judicial life, political life at this point. And it is the historian's responsibility to then mediate this interaction between the debtor and the person who they have to be paying. Now, this implies that there is an already established set of rules and codes that can be appealed to in order to figure out how the truth should be conducted. So we're already turning our gaze away from the gods as being the ultimate deciders and instead are turning to jurisprudence. Well, we're turning to establish rules and codes in order to figure out what is true and what is legitimate. So I just want to read that quote one more time, where here we see the kernels of a system of discourse in which the exercise of power, that is the right to formulate a decision, the forced reference to writing, and the establishment of truth are all linked together. So the manuscript then, in the, you know, the, from the lectures, then abruptly ends with Foucault suggesting that this system is almost deliberately cast aside and admonished in other places in Homer. So it's not as though it's entirely one or the other as far as the judicial process goes. It's not either, uh, you know, an established set of rules and codes and a court of law versus just judgment by the gods. It's not one or the other. The point is that they existed perhaps side by side forever. But over time, one of them began to gain more prominent than the other. That is the judicial one. And that puts us in here into week six. And we're just going to get right back into it. So in Homer, there are two kinds of judgment. There's war the warrior's judgment that emerges from the challenge from agonism that we saw with Menelaus and Antilochus, where Menelaus says, hey, Antilochus, you know, I'm challenging you to tell the truth because if you don't, you know, if you aren't truthful, you're going to be punished by the gods. So there's that kind of judgment. And then there's a kind of village-like adjudication where people come together, form a tribunal, and try to figure out the truth of a situation, uh, and they try to figure out proper uh, how much somebody should be compensated for something based off of previous instances in which these things have occurred, uh, try to appeal to a form of justice that is going to be best for the social body, not only in that moment, but thinking ahead for what will be best if this event keeps occurring, how will the social body deal with it? So it's not just a matter of, you know, will the gods decide? So we have these two kinds of justice occurring in Homer or judgment. We have the warrior's judgment and then a case of like a village-like tribunal judgment occurring. So in both cases, there is an adherence to a kind of truth and a desire for the truth. But the form of this truth varies between the two. In the case of warrior judgment, truth is like an oath to avoid the retaliation from the gods. So it's something that you say, like, I swear this is true, and if you believe it to be true, you won't be punished. Now, in the case of the village-like tribunal adjudication, truth is associated with, in Foucault's words, factual observation. So in the warrior situation, truth is a kind of test that is being exposed or exposing someone to undefined danger of the, the gods. And so often torture was used to coax someone to tell the truth. And interestingly, the role of torture would change when it became about getting someone to become a witness to an external event they may or may not have experienced. So I said that fast, so let me re-say that. So in the case in which truth doesn't necessarily need to follow along the lines of factual observation in the case of the warrior struggle and warrior judgment, where it becomes a matter of fear of punishment that is going to determine whether or not you're going to tell the truth. Torture can be used to get someone to tell the truth. And this is, if anyone's at all familiar with Foucault, you'd know very well that this is an idea that would extend far through uh, history. And its role, that is torture's role, would change. As he also me mentions here that I just said, it would not necessarily just become about getting someone to say a truth that was in them but also to get people to tell the truth about their experiences with others, what they have seen, what they could validate, to get somebody to validate a factual truth, an observation in the world that was not just about uh, fear of reprisal from the gods or uh, about one's own inner truth, but 
was about um, proving a truth, uh, a neutral, objective truth that exists out there. Now, in some texts, we see a little bit of the transformation from warrior judgment to village-like tribunal judgment, like in the case of Hesiod. So Hesiod wrote um, Works and Days, which is like, it's a, an interesting text uh, that can be quite boring, laying out like crop patterns and, you know, the procedures for running a farm and stuff like that. Yeah, just, you know, stuff like that. And <laughs> there's more to it, but in any case... So in the case of Hesiod, we see the transformation of warrior into village law. So, for example, there are two property owners who are in dispute at one point, and they call an authority who is neutral. That is, they're supposed to be neutral. So they don't mean someone from the aristocracy or um, like, a, like a ruler. They want somebody who can be a point of authority who is neutral. And then once they've done this, they compile witnesses to speak on each person's behalf. And these witnesses aren't necessarily attesting to factual observations, but enter into the game of the challenge as well, like in the case of warrior judgment. And they speak the truth for their side. So the verdict is arrived at by the number of witnesses and the weight of their oaths. So here we see a mixing of the two, right? We're seeing not just direct people involved in the struggle having to comply with this oath or participate in this oath telling as a way to arrive at truth for fear of, you know, if they tell the wrong truth, God is going to hurt them or the gods are going to hurt them. Now the witnesses have been called in and are part of that. They aren't necessarily attesting to factual observations they've had, but are instead giving their own truths that are informed by their own experiences with the person. Not saying like, oh yeah, I saw Bill steal $50 from Ted uh, the other day at nine o'clock. It was, you know, the sun was coming down. Uh, I think, I think John down the road saw it too. You know, I'll go get him and we can all confirm this. The truth would assume, assume a different form in attesting to people's characters, their propensity to tell the truth and so on. However, the fact that they're all called in this kind of uh, court-like setting with this neutral arbiter reveals that we are not entirely within the realm of warrior judgment or village-like tribunal judgment, but it is a mix of the, of the two and a transformation, as we will see, into an appreciation of village-like judicial judgment. So in both cases, like in, like in this one, it still plays out with fear from rulers and with fear from the gods. There's the fear that if you don't tell the truth, or if you're found to be guilty of something, you fear that the rulers are going to draw upon their knowledge of what has historically been done to people who have been guilty of this crime and liars. So they fear the rulers for that knowledge that they have. And they also fear the gods because they haven't, they haven't grown totally secular yet. They haven't totally gotten rid of their gods. They still very much fear, you know, what Zeus is going to do to them. So the entire thing is conducted with knowledge that there are these social codes and rules that must be followed, and people, uh, if they break them, will be punished for having inflicted harm against the social body. And this is what he calls dikazine, which I'm guaranteed pronouncing wrong. D-I-K-A-Z-E-I-N. Dikazine. Now he contrasts dikazine with Crinian, or crinine, K-R-I-N-E-I-N. Don't hurt me in the comments. Crinian, crinine. Now, in the case of crinine, a judge is present, but they do not necessarily have access to clearly established rules and established edicts. And so they essentially gamble their own lives in the conflict if they deliver a bad sentence. So the judge is like, Oh, you know, if, if I have improperly judged this situation, the gods are going to mess me up. Like the gods are going to come for me because I have unjustly inflicted harm upon somebody. So we have not fully gotten to, uh, to a kind of juridical framework here within the realm of crinine because the judge is not drawing upon 
clearly established facts that they could take solace in as having been the proper uh, forms of action. And this and Foucault doesn't say this, but the way that I understand this is that if the fear of the gods is that later on you're going to be punished by them, but if people continually do a thing, like in the case of passing judgment, you know, a judge passing judgment, and they keep passing the same kind of judgment onto a people or onto, onto people who are seen as guilty in certain situations, like a clearly established situation, and nothing that's bad has historically happened to those judges, like the gods, you know, Zeus didn't throw a lightning bolt at them, then it can enter into a broader social code that can be drawn to, that can be appealed to, that can be drawn from, in order to pass future judgment. So crinine is a situation in which a judge doesn't have knowledge. It might be a new kind of case, right? It, it might be a new situation. They don't know what they're doing. And so they fear that the gods might punish them if they do the wrong thing. Whereas in a situation in which the judge might have knowledge of previous events, instances where the same kind of conflict occurred, then they can say, oh, we have historically done this and the gods haven't been mad. So I'm just going to do this again. And they can draw upon that. And then there's a kind of what, what emerges is a confluence or an agreement between what people are socially accepting to be true and the will of the gods being proper in the eyes of the will of the gods. In the eyes of the will of the gods. In the eyes of the gods. I won't delete that. Just laugh at me. So with the introduction of a judge figure, like like we didn't see in the Iliad, right? Where the Iliad, Menelaus just turns to Antilochus and is like, hey, tell the truth. And then it's up to Antilochus. With the introduction of a so-called neutral objective judge, the site of conflict changes. So it's not just between two litigants, two people dueling this out uh, through argument or whatever. The responsibility leaves them, the litigants, to be contained in the judge whose verdict stands in for the truth. Because again, I mean, they can rest on the fact that this has been happening historically, or if it hasn't, it's just believed that they they fear God's punishment, so they're, they must be telling the truth in their judgment. So the judge assigns victory for Foucault. They are the ones that determine and establish what has been true in that situation. But on what basis, really? Like, how can we truthfully claim that anyone has that power to say that this is true or this isn't true? What is it that authorizes the sentence? And what sentence will be considered to be just? Like the proper sentence, the proper punishment for something having been committed. So some texts just say it, you know, it will be good. You know, the choice will be good. The verdict will be good. The sentence will be good. Because the statement will be just. But that's, I mean, that's just circular, right? It's good because it's just. It's just because it's good. It doesn't really get us anywhere. So instead, to properly understand the legitimacy of the judge's sentence in Greek society, we must remember that the case was first brought up by an individual, or by individuals, if two people came together. They will play a part in deciding the compensation and the judge will mediate the conflict between these recognized individuals. So, you know, the judge will be responsible for determining whether or not something bad has occurred. And then the people who have been involved will participate. The one who has felt themselves to have been afflicted, who has been hurt or damaged in some way, will then participate in deciding how much money they'll get or how the other person will be punished. Not all the time, but it was it was one possible situation or dynamic. But what is important here for Foucault is that in order for that to happen, there needed to be an acknowledgement that people had the ability to speak their own truth to the point that they could go to a neutral arbiter and say, we have conflicting accounts of the truth. It is your job, another individual, the, the neutral individual, to figure out which of us individuals is the most truthful. And when people would decide, like, the, the amount of compensation someone would receive, they would refer to, like in the case of Hesiod, they would refer to a term called DK, which, D-I-K-E is the term, uh, which is just 
can be loosely translated to the just or to justice, not necessarily to the gods. So it wouldn't say, okay, Zeus, you know, buddy, tell us how much this person owes someone else. They would appeal instead to this more abstract thing called the just or justice or decay. So in the situation in which the judge can draw upon clearly established rules, we can still see Crinian, (laughs) Crinian, exert itself in that situation, just now in a situation where the judge has access to such rules after enough time, after they've been established. And so we see the connection here of the discourse of justice with a forming political discourse and with knowledge of a political order. Where in the case of DK in Hesiod, it was attached to a certain political rationality and to a political order. It was meant to reflect the values of the elite. Because, like, come on, at the time, how many people were really literate? Uh, And how many people were going to have enough power to actually be litigious? I guess, you know, dealing with Greek society, to have already been an individual implies that you're probably already wealthy. You know, enslaved people were not going to be considered individuals. But in any case, it would be the most powerful that are going to lay out the conditions for possible the conduct of justice, how it would unfold. And in order to arrive here required the formalization of the written law and the establishment of political and judicial power. And finally, and this might seem counterintuitive, a situation in which the people seize power and actually come to power to some to some extent. So you need written law because if you just relied purely upon the oral tradition, it's going to be hard to keep track of every single uh, recourse or every single plan of action for an event, you know, to pass judgment, which isn't to say that uh, people who live in an oral uh, society who rely upon orality cannot still have lots of memory and remember many facts. But it opens the door for a lack of cohesion among different examples of justice, where one judge in one territory, one neighborhood, might say something, pass a judgment on an event, that another judge in another situation might decide differently, which isn't necessarily bad. I mean, if that's how the society is organized, that's okay. But in order for this new kind of justice to emerge around a judge, a neutral judge who could draw upon laws, these laws needed to be consecrated and enshrined, calcified, established, so that they could be easily drawn upon. Now that puts us here into week seven. So from Hesiod, there are two kinds of juridical action. Like we said, there's dikazine, which is uh, kind of the, the struggle the oath referring to, um, I am thinking I said that mixed up earlier. Anyways, Dickazine is referring to the warrior's struggle, agonism, to that kind of justice and judgment, whereas Crinine is referring to the just, as though there's this thing called justice. It has been established through written law, through political order, political exertion of power, and so on. So, Crinine marks a transference of authority from the gods to judges. So, it's not like fearing God's wrath, you fear the judge's wrath. However, in this situation, DK still maintains an attachment to the gods, because even though justice has come to be uh, established within the social body, you know, there's still the acknowledgement that the gods are the supreme rulers, they're going to decide what is just, even though we have like more clearly established guides for what that justice looks like. It's not just up to interpretation what we think the gods uh, would want. So here, as I've already suggested in some words, here we see the formation of the first kind of public body that feels itself to be attacked if someone commits a crime because the people believe that the source of their cohesion is around people's adherence to these codes, to these laws. So if anyone breaks them, it is viewed as being an attack on the social body itself. And so we see that justice begins to take shape, in Foucault's words, in the measured system of services, debts, 
and their repayment, that is, instead of exposure to both the imminent and indefinite vengeance of Zeus. So people now are organizing themselves in accordance with systems of services, of debts, and repayments, so around capital, around money in a lot of cases, and not necessarily around what the gods might think of them. And here we start to see a broader epistemological shift in the way that people understand the world and organize their knowledge of the world. That is, I understand epistemological here in being uh, referring to the study of knowledge and how knowledge is constructed, how people organize um, belief systems in established ways that they come to take for knowledge. And at this point, we see the entrance of expirations, of debts, of time frames, of quantifications, of linear time into justice. And this complies more broadly with a shift from an oral culture to a written culture, a culture that relies on the spoken word and versus a culture that relies on the written word. Because if you are an oral culture, you experience time and space quite differently than a written culture. And that is because if you rely on your ear, and I'm taking this from Marshall McLuhan, if you rely on your ear and hearing, your relationship with the world is going to be quite different than someone who relies on their eyes in that how they, they see things, they, they see written words, and they always see written words in a linear way, which opens the door for coding, for establishing rules and edicts and uh, making sure that debt payments are up to date, making sure that people can keep track of their finances, wherein in an oral tradition, you couldn't really do that. It'd be, it'd be really hard to keep track of all of these little things. And so with the introduction of the written word and with writing culture, suddenly all these things could be, could be tracked. But that also opens the door for them to be highly controlled and maintained. So here he offers three fun qualities of crinine. Crinine. Crinine, I'm pronouncing it different every time. Whatever. Crinian. There, there is memory of the identical and its measure. So you can start measuring things. There is the disclosure of the truth and the exercise of sovereignty. Now at this point, justice is justice is concomitant. It, it comes alongside uh, the true word of measure and order. Conversely, the true cycle of things, the real proportions, the return of the calendar is justice itself in the distribution of things. Where, and all of these things are referring to a different way in which space and time are organized. You could plot out charts of land, record who owns what piece of land so that you can trade more. You can, you can allow the exchange of payment. You could uh, organize dates on a calendar. You could establish events to take place on certain dates in like a new way than an oral tradition would have before then. And so who most closely adheres to these will be seen as being just. Who most c closely complies with these, uh, this, this shift and with these emerging forms of knowledge building and knowledge conduct that adhere to this, to, to linear thought, to the written word to establish rules and codes, that is the person who's going to be viewed as more just. Now, Foucault doesn't say this in this text, in these lectures, but this is what he's saying in terms of Aristotle's treatment of the sophists, is that Aristotle did not know that he was just subject to this shift in belief about what is justice, and he just internalized these values appreciation of these things as being implicitly associated with the just. And that's why he couldn't actually form formulate and easily illustrate what was different between a sophist and himself. He would just rely upon these things and he couldn't necessarily say that, say it, but he was subject to them and just internalized them to be the truth. And anyone who didn't was seen as being false. So in this situation, we do not just arrive at truth through a kind of struggle or appeal to the gods. We now have entire systems to help us arrive at truth. And these things didn't emerge among the Greeks, really. 
There are examples of it from further east with the Assyrians, um, with the Lydians, I think that's, <laughs> someone fact check me. I don't know. I didn't, I don't, that word just came to my head for some reason. So the Assyrians, where knowledge of origin and successions, knowledge of quantities, knowledges of event, of occasion, all of these ideas started to, came from these parts of the world, and the Greeks took it up. And it was also used for uh, revolutionary purposes, in the case of military movements and organizations and politics. However, of these three kinds of knowledge that came from further east, that is knowledge of origin and successions, knowledge of quantities and knowledge of event and occasion, the third one has been the most marginalized, that is knowledge of events and occasion. And that is because, and it's just been associated with sophistry and the sophists who apparently love the event. It's all about the event. It's all about immediate knowledge that you can take from an event, not about broader knowledge that was just code word for complying with all of these fundamental rules that Aristotle was not uh, totally aware of, and Plato for that matter. They didn't know their own history. Uh, at least that's kind of what Foucault is suggesting without, you know, saying it because that would be mean. Can't be mean to Aristotle and Plato. And that puts us here into week eight. So with this, you know, these emerging logics allowed for measurements to facilitate and solidify equivalences, especially in exchange. You know, so if you have money, it makes it really easy to exchange things. Now, as opposed to justice seen in Homer, this kind of justice is not linked to the exercise of a certain sovereignty and to the moment of ritual exercise. It is a justice of every day, of the every day, which is implemented by every man when he works and exchanges. Every part of your day is working within the realm of justice as it has been established through time. So truth is not wagered here. It's not like struggled for. It is just agreed upon before any conflict can emerge. So when these two individuals went to the, uh, the judge... They already believed that an injustice has occurred, especially in all the examples I've been giving. Like, they believe that their property was infringed upon, that their debt, uh, that the other person owned the money. The only way they could have known this is if there is already an established form of record keeping that complies with a certain stage of human development in this setting, in Greek society, where there was a change in the ways in which people organized their association with knowledge and organized the way that they accumulated knowledge, accumulated facts, and the weight they attributed to that accumulation, to what they knew. And this also produced the effect of allowing Greece to move away from its tyrannical roots to form city-states in which there was it was ostensibly comprised of individuals who weren't ruled by like single rulers. And so we get democracy emerge, which democracy comprised of two Greek words, uh, demos and kratos. Demos is refers to the people and kratos is power. Kratos is like the god kratos, like from God of War, if anyone plays video games or that video game. So democracy uh, specifically means power of the people. And so in that case, we saw the emergence of this power of the people because justice began to be a distributed thing among the entire social body, not just to be bestowed by rulers who could say, oh, I'm buddies with, you know, Zeus, so I can tell you what's true, what's just, and anything like that. So what else, what else came along? <laughs> Some other stuff came along. Um, there was new forms of tax collection that came about. There was tracking lunar cycles, developing infrastructure, and all of this required the centralization of knowledge so that experts could emerge who could study this stuff for a long time based off previous knowledge that has been written down, and they can build upon that knowledge. Where if you are trying to do a math equation, it's a lot easier if you can write your work down and follow along than trying to just think a math equation through in your head. Now imagine that on the entirety of human history, but thinking about much bigger problems than a single math equation. You can add to knowledge in new ways, which isn't to say it's necessarily better, it's different. And as these ideas become normalized, they become to be associated with just the natural order of things. 
with just the way that things are. Of course, the world just adheres to its being carved out for the sake of property ownership. Of course, geometry can be used to understand the world, even though you will never see a triangle in real life on Earth, ever. As far as a triangle must be comprised of three sides with three angles that amount up to how many degrees? 180? However many degrees it's supposed to amount up to, amount up to, you will never, ever see that. But geometry, being, you know, a product of this type of thing, comes to be associated with the truth in some way or form. It, it comes to be associated with a kind of truth, but it is only, we have to acknowledge now that we have this knowledge, thanks to Foucault, that it is a truth that has been created, which isn't necessarily bad. People agree upon these things. It's great. The problem is when that truth comes to be associated with some transcendental, you know, the truth of gods, the truth of like the universe itself, when it is only, a, you know, a created truth. So as this knowledge began to be distributed, you know, common folk could have knowledge of justice that they could use to defend themselves against the powerful. And another de important development was the Iron Age that brought about uh, that was brought about by Dorian invasions, because suddenly there was an abundance of iron as well. It's just an additional point. Or to, you know, around the 6th and 7th centuries uh, before uh, Common Era, you know, a few, a few centuries before um, Plato and before Socrates, the Iron Age changed battle to include more shields, spears, and swords. Hoplites would carry a shield on their left, protecting their comrade well, there while being protected from the person on their right. So they have a shield on their 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 left, uh, and so that would be protecting them and the person next to them. And that person would have a shield on their left arm, which would protect them and the person next to them. And so you'd have a wall of these shields, which is just like a different way that battle was starting to be organized here. So Hoplite's strategy entailed the recipro reciprocity between uh, the comrades, between soldiers. Uh, and it, it allowed them to engage in a new kind of service and help with the synchronization of movements and the spontaneous regulation of the whole. So they started to form one unitary mass among themselves, like in the uh, film 300, if anyone's seen 300. I don't know why I have so many pop culture references today. But in that film, film, is that pretentious? In that movie... The reason that 300 soldiers are able to win is that they work as a single unit. And it doesn't matter how many people you throw at it, because all of those people is just one at a time. And what you effectively see in that situation is one against 300. And the one will always lose, even if you do it 10 million times. Eventually they lose, because it takes a long time, but they are able to defend against tens of thousands of soldiers before they... Uh, end up having they, they uh, fall fall prey to what's the guy's name the <laughs> the antagonist anyways I don't I don't remember it's been way too long and I don't remember the actual story so in any case there was also an emerging market because I've already been mentioning money where people often that is poor people would develop skills to be competitive in that market so some aristocrats sided with these peasants these peasant artisans, while other arist aristocrats sided with landlords and merchants producing a conflict among the aristocracy. Some of them sided with the artisanal peasants and some of them sided with the landowners. So here he says that there are three big takeaways and we're going to get into this in the final part next week where we're really going to talk about the role of money here. But the three big takeaways he gives us to close off is the invention of money, the written law, and the institution of justice with a religious model. So we haven't touched on that yet. That'll come next week, but yeah. That'll close off week eight. Next week will be week nine, our fourth part. If you like what I did, like, share, subscribe. You can leave a review on a podcast platform. Uh, if you, yeah, if, yeah. If you don't like what I did, you can say that too. Yeah, on that note, take care of yourselves and see you next week.